Beethoven, I think so many people associate with him or, or love him because they sense his struggle. He really had a difficult life and he had a lot of struggles, both physical, you know, he was deaf. And, you know, he struggled with that. He, he was a difficult person to be around in some cases. And you can see a lot of that struggle, that work ethic in his music. Hello, welcome to And If Love Remains. I'm your host, Mike Levitt. And I am, again, ha- so happy to have my friend, um, Dr. Elias Axel Pedersen, on with us. We're going to talk some Beethoven, and it's going to be fabulous. Um, he's been on a, f- quite a few times before. Um, and uh, so just a quick intro. He, uh, um, Dr. Pedersen got his doctorate at uh, the, the uh, University of Montreal, yeah. um, and he is a frequent performer and lecturer. Um, he also founded the uh, uh, in 2015 the Southwest Piano Festival, um, and he's also the director of uh, uh, program development at the Arizona Piano Fest uh, Institute. Excuse me, Arizona Piano Institute. Um, he has a, a YouTube channel that he's putting content up at. You can just look it up at Elias Axel Pedersen. Um, and then, of course, his website is www.eapetterson.com and a, a wealth of information there. Um, and again, I'm, I'm happy to have him on. This is, this is a momentous event. We're going to talk a little bit about Beethoven specifically because this is the anniversary of his, of the, of his birth. 250 years ago, he was born. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well... Thanks, Mike. It's uh, it's great to be back. I'm very excited to, to talk about Beethoven, a certain piece, and and many other issues surrounding that t- today. So thanks for having me back. Oh, it's my pleasure. It's great. We're and and wh- we're going to do what I love to do, which is we're going to talk about a person, um, and we're going to talk about a specific piece, um, and we're going to talk about his uh, Sonata Number no. Twenty Six his Lea Du, his piano sonata. This is a piece that you've performed. And, um, but before we get into that, just a little bit of context, I, I like to, you know, sometimes I like to talk about the, um, uh, when we talk about Western music, we can talk about BB or AB before Beethoven or after Beethoven. Um, I, I have often thought, you know, Mozart as brilliant and as, as he was, was really, uh, the, perfect man of his time. He was a a classical artist and he just did that perfectly where Beethoven, it was the, the quintessential innovator. I mean, if you listen to his early works compared to the work at the end of his career, it's so different um, and just changed the musical landscape. Um, That's how I feel. What, what do you think, Elias? Well, well, that's a huge topic. I, I love talking about these kinds of things, you know, where, Beethoven fits into culture and society, you know, and, and his own culture and society in, in uh, Western Europe, um, in, in classical music. It's very, you know, like you say, Mozart, we think of as this, this natural genius. Um, and it's tough to use the word genius, by the way. It's, it's just kind of thrown around and uh, it's hard to say to whom it sticks. But but Mozart had such a fluency and an ease with which he composed. Of course, he was working things out in his mind, um, and it just fit perfectly in the time, like you said. Uh, there are some visionary things, of course. But with Beethoven, I think so many people associate with him or, or love him because they sense his struggle. Uh, he, he really had a difficult life, and he had a lot of struggles, both physical. You know, he was deaf uh, for part of his or, or almost deaf, I would say, by uh, the middle or so of his career and, and virtually deaf by the end. And, you know, he struggled with that. He, he was a difficult person to be around in some cases, probably partially because of that. He didn't feel comfortable in all social situations. And you can see a lot of that struggle, that work ethic in his music. Um, and I think that's why people relate to him. And as you said, you, you see such a, a development in his style and his musical language, in his thought process. Um, even between works, even between genres, you see how he really uh, developed ideas and and progressed. Uh, and some things are are really foretelling what comes 50, 100 years later. I mean, he wrote some late works 
which uh, which seem almost like they could be written in the 20th century. Right. So it's, it's pretty advanced stuff, you know, and these yeah, are the people I mean, that and, and, stand out. And piano, I mean, his, uh, a lot of people like to, like to turn to his um, string quartets as, mm-hmm. as, you know, just truly innovative stuff, but his piano sonatas are truly sublime. And, and, mm-hmm. you know, and we're often, you know, we, we know the, the pathetic, we know uh, moonlight, um, but, but, and there, yeah, but, there are by some the way, that, that just need to be, and I think this is one of those, the, the, uh-huh. the Lea Du. Yeah, Les Adieu, and and actually he didn't name all of the sonatas. So a lot of the names that we have, like uh, Pathétique and and like you said, Moonlight, you know, he, he didn't give those names, much like Chopin didn't name a lot of his pieces that we know as uh, Raindrop Prelude or whatever. He, he never named them as such. But uh, with Beethoven, Les, uh, Les Adieu, or Das Lebewohl, which is the German, uh, is very apt a name, and he really built that into the music, which which uh, we'll get into. Um I also wanted to touch, I thought we could maybe structure this converse, conversation on, you know, how do we, how do we even judge Beethoven? How do we put him in, in our look back in, in you know, Western culture and things like, things like that? How does he fit into today? Because keep in mind, uh, we're talking about a very small sliver of, of uh, the population that might be even performing or listening to classical music. Uh, and even back then it was, it was just part of it. It was more the elite that could listen to this kind of music. Uh, and that's that has to do with the piece too, because it's actually dedicated to one of his patrons. So the whole concept of patronage was was very important in that culture. Um, and then also, you know, what music and Beethoven means today to us, especially during, during a pandemic, you know, how it's bringing us together. Uh, and talking about Beethoven himself, different periods, you know, we, we categorize him, or at least musicologists do, into early, middle, and late periods. Obviously, he didn't think of it that way. You know, he didn't live his life and say, "Oh, you know, I'm I'm 30 now. It's it's my middle period." It's right. Um, yeah, and then kind of looking at his three large corpses of work, where we have the piano sonatas, symphonies, and string quartets. You could argue the violin sonatas, which actually were piano and violin sonatas for the early ones. Um, there are ten of those, so that, that's fairly large, but nothing on the scale of the other three groups. So, um, yeah, I thought we'd, I, I don't know which jumping off point you want to. Well, I think, take. I think that you're the, the first topic you mentioned, you know, uh, talking about Beethoven, um, you know, as a whole, let, let's start there. What, what, um, I'll, I'll let you lead a little bit on this where, <laughs> um, what are your thoughts on, on, um, the context of this piece and, and, and what, um, yeah. What, why don't you go ahead and get started sure. with this? Yeah, the context of of just Beethoven in general, you know, uh, he's he's been brought up recently. I don't know for those of you that have followed some news uh, in a couple instances. So at the beginning of the year, uh, I read a, a composer's blog that basically recommended uh, perhaps having a moratorium on Beethoven's work for this year. And while I first thought that that might be a bit extreme, the reasoning behind it was that uh, how were how were composers celebrated in the past? If it was a big birthday, usually what happens is that there is a big Festschrift, which is a German word, a, a compilation of works for and dedicated to the composer by other composers. Right. So, and then there would be, you know, maybe a celebration at the end of the year where it, uh, where the big concert, the composer in question would be invited, and all these other composers' works would be performed for him or her. Um, mostly him, as the case would be, just uh, just how things are, and we can get into that too. But, um, you know, we don't do that much anymore. We kind of just see Beethoven as this big name and his music is, is already 200 some odd years old. And, and that's what we play. So this composer was saying, well, why don't we have a group of uh, living composers create something either together or separately and uh, in, in dedication to him and, and play that kind of music, promote that kind of music. And it's funny that Beethoven would be the, I guess, target, good or bad, of this idea, because um, there was a similar thing during Beethoven's day, the Diabelli variations, where uh, uh, composers throughout Europe were asked to submit a a variation on a certain theme that was done by Diabelli, so a very old composer. Right. And a lot of composers submitted, you know, their theme to it. And Beethoven said, you know what, I'm going to write my uh, my own entire piece with that theme and variations on it. And I don't know, I think he wrote 30 some odd variations. It's, 
it's like a 50 minute work or something like that. I can't wow. remember. It, it's a huge work. And he just took that, you know, took it all the way. And, and that was kind of the way to celebrate Diabelli in that day. Uh, you know, this, I think about somebody Chopin, Schumann, Brown, all the, all the big names of that day, of the day. Uh, and so maybe we can do something like that uh, in, I think in combination with performing his works as well. Of course, with the pandemic, it's been very difficult to perform anything uh, certainly live, at, at least here in this country and in, in North America. I know a lot of countries and you know, Australia and, and Northern European countries are doing much better and they're, they're almost back to normal. Uh, but uh, it's tough. And so how do we disseminate this kind of music and how do we perform it for people? And that's been a, been a big challenge. Um, another issue is how to, how to fit Beethoven into our cultural I guess, idiom and how do we judge him? Because we have to keep in mind that at that time, uh, classical music was very controlled and, and it still is. And it came from a tradition of patronage. So who, who was in power? It was all white males uh, and Europeans and that culture. And so he kind of was writing in that system, in that culture with those ideas and musical languages. You know, he wasn't using African rhythms or, or Asian tonalities, you know, harmonies, it was Western harmony. Right. Uh, and so it's hard to say, uh, and I don't even know if it's necessary or needed to, to say like, he's the greatest composer ever, or one of the greatest, I mean, in this tradition, I think he is. And uh, those that argue maybe that, that there are others that could have been given a chance. Yes, uh, of course, of course. And, and luckily we're starting to give those people chances now. Um, but music has changed and the, the way that we perform music has changed. In Beethoven's day, you didn't play older music. Uh, it would have been unheard of to, to go to multiple performances of like Palestrina or Monteverdi or, or even Bach, which wasn't that, that uh, far behind. Um, you, you played contemporary works and most composers were great performers. They played their own works too. Right. Um, and we just, we don't have that today. There's a whole slew of great pianists out there that don't compose. I mean, I, I get ask, asked all the time, do you compose? I say, well, I'm embarrassed to say I do. I don't really. I, I wrote a few things for theory class and, and some you know, little minuets and some transcriptions, but not really. I don't consider myself at all a composer. Uh, I'm a pianist and a musician and all these other, other things that go along with it. But back then, um, Schumann, you know, Brahms, Beethoven, Liszt, Chopin, Mozart, uh, they were all performers of their own music and of their contemporary musicians. So um, it's it's very different to to kind of judge their music today because it's it's sort of a museum that we're keeping alive. And uh, yeah, that's that's a big debate. I just I want people to understand that that's the debate out there, and there's there's some self reflection that needs to be done. Um, yeah. And, yeah, and I, I think, think he's a great composer to do it with because there's so uh, he much is a depth. great composer to do it with because. I think he's um I think you can make the argument that he he's at least in contemporary music um he he may be the most like if you were to if you were to take a, a um a thread if you're going to if you're going to look at the root of where so much of um today's music or or even you know throughout the 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 19th and 20th century at least um that seed I think I'll, so much comes from Beethoven Yes. I mean, he was in a tradition and in a long line in a way, but he not only changed things or altered them or perfected them, you know, he was, he did all that. It was very innovative. Like certainly we're going to talk about Sonata form with respect mm -hmm. to this piece. And he really took that form and, and developed it a lot. Uh, previous generations of composers, even the early classicists like Haydn and Mozart, they stuck to, Haydn was a little different, but you know, you had some formulas most sonatas were were just three movements. That's how it was, uh, and that was already a departure from the Baroque style, which was, uh, you know, Scarlatti sonatas were are just binary forms essentially. Right. Um, Bach wrote sonatas, and, and they're often in, in three movements. So you get that development of the sonata form around the, the late Baroque. But by Beethoven, he has sonatas in two movements. He has sonatas in three movements. He has sonatas in four movements. And then after that, or shortly after that, you get people like Schumann and Liszt, um, who would have crossed paths with, with Beethoven. And, you know, Liszt has this famous one movement sonata, which is actually a three-part uh, piece and actually more like a fantasy in some ways. 
and then you get uh, people that write four and five movement sonatas. So I think a lot of that stems from Beethoven's, oh, Beethoven's innovations. Absolutely. I mean, his, his, I think his innovation of the sonata form is just, I mean, he turned it on its head in a lot of ways. I mean, yeah. you know, he, he, in fact, let's, let's, let's talk about that for a second. Cause I, I, th- I think a lot of people, when, when they hear sonata form or, or, you know, what does that mean? Mm-hmm. Um, and, 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 you know, I like to think of it as the um, early, you know, or a more, a sophisticated version of, of if you were to take a pop song, it has a form, you know, you have, mm-hmm. you have a, an intro, a verse, maybe a second verse and then a chorus and then another verse and then a chorus and then a bridge and then another chorus. And, and pretty much every rock or pop song kind of Follow. follows that same pattern. And that's what we expect to hear when we listen to it on the radio. Yeah. And, and Sonata is a similar thing, except for it just has a different, um, it, you know, it, it, just think about it a little bit differently. So why don't, you, why don't you explain what sonata form is? Yeah, this is good. And and also for laymen, perhaps non-musicians, uh, they can relate to, like you said, the pop song. And and uh, 99% of pop songs follow that fairly basic formula. Um, and it's very successful, by the way. It works. There, there are some that I can think of. I think I mentioned Sting in the past. Uh, occasionally, those people will break that mold. Um, and they'll maybe do an extra verse, or maybe the outro isn't the same, or maybe they've got two bridges, uh, right. you know, or maybe the chorus is built into the. I mean, there are so many ways to, to. Uh, but take but that even form within that, it's it's within the context of that form, and so you, we notice it when it's different. Right, right, yeah, because the form is so ubiquitous. Um, so sonata form has a a basic uh, you know structure to it, uh, and then within that structure. There are a lot of elements that can be changed. The, the basic structure is three parts. Uh, you know, you've got your exposition. An exposition is where you basically expose what are the, the themes. So I'll break that down in a second. After the exposition, you've got a development section. And as the name would imply, that develops themes that you, um, that you, you know, introduce in the exposition. But I'll get into that too because Beethoven does some funny things in the developments often. And then you have what's called a recapitulation uh, or a recap. So you're bringing back some of the the original material or all of the original material, but in usually the original key. So when we talk about keys, you know, what is the key of a piece? It's basically um, what kind of scale does that does that piece follow? What what notes or uh, what scale does that piece follow? And this piece is particularly interesting because it's an E flat major. Now, today, we don't really think of keys as having uh, meanings necessarily or associations, but in Beethoven's day, there were definite associations with keys. And people that have perfect pitch uh, also, so th- this is uh, getting into a little bit uh, of a sidetrack, um, and this, this is called, uh, what, what is it when you, um, you probably know the term for this, when like you can hear colors. Oh, uh, yeah, uh, it's... Um... Yes. Oh, you, you know the term, but I yeah. do know the term. It's, it's, a, it's a, yeah, it's a technical term that, that, yeah. When you hear a certain pitch, you yeah. hear, you can yeah. see blue. Yeah. Or, right. Right. Or, or hear you know, blue. For example. Yeah. Syn- synesthesia. That's what that's it. Synesthesia. Yes. Yeah. So, um, this has to do a little bit with perfect pitch as well. Um, in Western culture, we don't have a ton of people with perfect pitch. I think the statistics or something like one in a hundred or something or one in a thousand once you go to music schools then you you see higher rates and, but interestingly from other countries especially countries with more tonal languages like uh, Chinese Japanese Korean, th- those kinds of cultures produce more um, students with perfect pitch I think for other reasons too I mean they're they're starting training a little bit earlier and, and more seriously um, well and, and I also think that we think of we think of it differently for example if I right. go to you know, I know tons of audio engineers that, you know, they may not know the exact pitch, but they'll say, you know what, I think that the, you know, they're at, at, uh, you know, two, 2100 Hertz needs to be dropped a little bit. And it turns out that's like a B flat or, you know what I mean? Like right, they, right. They, they may not know that what tone that is, but they, but they can hear the frequency, which is no different. It's just a different mm-hmm. word. Right. Yeah. That's interesting. The frequency. So we always in this culture know a to be 440, 440 Hertz. And uh, for those people in classical music, we know that that wasn't always the case. Uh, so the definition of actually what A is or B or C has changed. And right. we, 
you know, non-musicians just, oh, well, that's just a, an objective thing. It's not so objective. It's, uh, it's change. And even, well, and even, and even the, the tuning, like, I mean, yes. if we want to talk about, you know, well-tempered tuning versus equal temper, I mean, I mean, like what we hear today is, it could very well be far different um, for so many reasons than, than what we heard in Beethoven's or Bach's day. Yeah. Yeah. For, exactly. And that, that's a great thing to talk about too, because when we talk about innovator, as a musician, Beethoven was a huge innovator from the compositional standpoint, but also just for for the hardware. You know, he pushed piano makers to make larger instruments, right. stronger instruments, louder instruments that could take his his keys. He was known. Oh, I think I think there's a definite there's a there's a direct link to the piano that we hear today to the music that Beethoven was demanding from in the early 19th century. Yeah, yeah I think so. Um, so yeah, let's, uh, I know we're all these topics are, are awesome. <laughs> we got lots of branches out there. So let's, yeah, focus back down to the yeah. Sonata. I apologize. No, it's great. Me too. Uh, so the Sonata form, when we talk about these, uh, each section, uh, there, there are also transitions between them and retran what we call retransitions. And often there are ending sections, which we call closing material. Um, and then sometimes there's a coda, which is an addendum at the end. So it's kind of like you ended, but then, well, here's a little extra, like a, like an epilogue of a book. So usually in, uh, in Sonata structure, you have two themes. That's, that's pretty typical. You, you have the first theme. So I was talking about what key it is in, and this is an E flat, um, which, which did mean something is, this is a hunting key often or a, um, a triumphant a heroic key. Uh, and then you realize that this was dedicated, you know, to his, the Archduke Rudolf and that was his, one of his patrons, and so why not, you know, do something that's triumphant and heroic for your for your patron? Um, and another reason why the E flat is particularly of that character is uh, horns. This was before they had valve horns, really, like you, you'd see in today's orchestra. But natural horns, um, they resonate on, on certain frequencies. So E flat is a good one. B flat, F, those are the sort of frequencies that are much easier to play in. So Horn concertos from that era are often in those keys. You never get horn concerto in C sharp major. You know, it's maybe a modern one, but not one from the classical or the Baroque. The Baroque so, era. so I have a question, like, because that's actually a really interesting point. The horns and the and the triumphalism, and and obviously he was writing this for royalty. However, I mean, the name Les Adieux or, or uh, yeah. Le, Le Beauvoir, you know, mm -hmm. farewell or good, you know, is, yeah. what what. I mean, it's it's kind of uh, um, well, it's bittersweet. It, it doesn't seem to to go together. Yeah, it's it's bittersweet. So you know, at this time, we have to consider where where Europe was, and of course, there are wars going on all the time. And at this, uh, this was written in around eighteen nine, eighteen ten, and eighteen oh eight, eighteen ten. And the French, um, there was a French attack on Vienna, on Austria, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, led by none other than Napoleon Bonaparte, and um, as a result, this Archduke Rudolf, who was, you know, a, an aristocrat in the Austro-Hungarian Empire, had to flee, you know, to protect his life, probably his his family, whatever. So he had to leave the city. And um, I don't know if he knew that he was going to come back or not. I mean, who knew? Napoleon was such a strong force at that time. Uh, and so Beethoven wrote this uh, and saying that, you know, it's farewell, basically. Le Bevol is is farewell or abs, and and then the second movement is absence it's mm -hmm. uh, my my german's terrible but uh abwesenheit and wiedersehen or das wiedersehen is the reunion so it ends up being more triumphal at the end like oh we are going to see each other uh, or maybe that was just hopeful that yes we are going to see each other but uh, yeah it's kind of a bittersweet piece and i think where it lays in his output as well the of, of the sonatas it's towards the beginning of the late of the late sonatas so his style was very mature. This is a very mature piece in some ways. And yet it's one of the hardest sonatas just from a technical standpoint. There are, there are some pyrotechnics and what I like to call knuckle busters yeah. in that third movement. It's just incredibly difficult. And even in the first movement, there is a famous section about two measures in the, um, in the, um, in the I can't think of the word, not the exposition, sorry, exposition. And then one uh, one section in the, recapitulation that is virtually I mean, it's just so hard to play correctly and, and precisely 
One, one more, one more before we, we just dig right into it. Cause I, I do want to get right into it, but one more just kind of historical question. Um, Cause my understanding, and so please correct me if I'm wrong, Beethoven kind of had a love hate relationship with Napoleon, didn't he? Mm-hmm. I yeah. mean, obviously he, he, he loved, I mean, he loved being, being able to write music for royalty. And so his mm-hmm. patron, he loved, <laughs> but, but, right. Beth- but Napoleon as an idea, he seemed to love and then, then seemed, things fell apart. Yeah, it's interesting because he, the third symphony, he was going to dedicate, and I played that symphony in, in high school in an orchestra. I played violin and, and I remember talking about this and kind of reading and our conductor talked to us about it, that Napoleon had written on the uh, title page an inscription dedicating it to Napoleon. Um, and Beethoven eventually crossed that out because he saw that Napoleon was basically uh, invading places. And he didn't like that. He didn't think that was appropriate, you know, and this is where the composer was really taking a, and a big name composer at the time was taking a political stance and saying, that, right. you know, you can be your leader. I mean, it, I don't know if you saw him as a dictator in France because he was in another empire and he probably just saw him as that, that leader over there. We didn't, he didn't have the communication that we do today, but, but as soon as Napoleon overstepped his bounds, and started, uh, you know, conquering, other people, the nations, they told him, ah, I, I, this I don't condem- condone. You know, in fact, I condemn it. So he took the, the uh, dedication off and then he rededicated it to uh, some prince, I think Levkowitz or something. Yeah. So that's interesting. Yeah. That, that's he, like you say, love hate relation. I think he appreciated, he knew that his money, his bread and butter, he, he knew who, who buttered his bread. It was the royalty giving him, him right. uh, patronage. But he, you know, drew the line. I think he had, I mean, and I th- he seemed to have a little bit of a populist streak in him. Yeah. Um, and some of his pieces, too, have, I mean, he wrote songs and certainly a couple operas. And, and they, they weren't that successful. But but uh, he he drew a lot of inspiration from from the countryside, from the folk tunes. From, you know, he has, he has uh, these three sets of bagatelles, one of the very early, on, uh, I think it's Opus 26. Um, and by the way, for those that don't know, when I say opus this or opus that, it's just a, catalog, a way to catalog something. So it's like if I were to say uh, Genesis 2, 3, you know, or Matthew 5, verse whatever. Uh, that's the kind of thing. So op- usually right. things are in an opus. Sometimes each opus has two or three pieces in it. And then within those pieces, there are movements in those pieces. So uh, it, it's a, it, roughly, and this is truly roughly, but roughly it's like a, a publishing number almost. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. It kind of keeps the order of uh, when it was written and hopefully when it was published. Now, obviously, there are some examples, even with Beethoven, Rage, of the Lost, Rage Over the Lost Penny, which I think is Opus 126. And clearly, that's from an earlier period in his life right. that he wrote it, but he just didn't get it published until he had already published you know, most of his works. And then there are there's another Opus number or, or category called W-O-O, without Opus, or I think it's something Ona Orta. Um, and that means that it was published posthumously, but posthumously so mm-hmm. after their death. Uh, but anyway, the the early um, th- this sonata that we're talking about today is Opus eighty one A. So, and Beethoven's last opus was I think like one thirty five ish. I think that was his last string quartet. Okay, so we're on the second, the the beginning of the second half of his. Career. Yeah, and, and into what we would say is the third part. You know, the the late period. Um, again, Beethoven didn't think that okay, I'm in the late period. But if you look at the progression of his pieces, uh, they, they sort of fall into these three general categories. Um, and it is interesting to see how he, how he experimented with which genres. So out of the three large genres that he wrote, the piano sonatas, there are 32 piano sonatas, a huge group, uh, usually split, it, split into two volumes. And then the, the nine symphonies, um, I don't know if he started the 10th or there were just sketches for it. But, uh, you know, those are famous symphonies. And then the string quartets. And he wrote 20 some odd string quartets. Um, So usually his development was, let me do something with the piano sonata. I mean, he was a fantastic pianist and keyboardist. Uh, Let me experiment. Let me uh, refine that kind of with the the symphony, all those techniques that I developed. And then in the string quartets, he really pared it down and made it sparse and, and just the essentials. That's so, so interesting. Yeah, every period you see that kind of progression where the, er, the sonata, and then here comes a symphony around that same time, and then the string quartets at that same time. 
And well, and that, that makes a lot of sense because you can hear a lot, you know, when you hear, especially some of his later um, sonatas, I mean, they, they almost could double as a, a, a piano concerto in a way. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the cert- or even a symphony. I mean, the Hammer right. Club here, talk about breaking form. And, uh, you know, we, we think of the big sonatas of Mozart or Haydn. Haydn's E flat is probably the biggest uh, number 52. And that's, uh, I don't know, maybe 20. 20- 25 minutes, maybe 20 minutes, I guess. A Mozart, you, you look at like the B major or the or the B flat, those are on order of 18, 20 minutes, maybe with all the repeats. You know, and then Beethoven's Hammerklavier, which is opus 106, it's uh it's the fourth from the end. I mean, it's 50 minutes long. It's right. huge. And uh, I actually have not much interest to play it. It's just <laughs> so big. Uh, but I love the last three, 109, 110, 111. And 111 is so far out there in a way. It's, uh, it's pretty pretty bizarre. And there's a section in there that almost sounds like honky-tonk jazz, but it's yes. not. Uh, so, I mean, he's he's like 150 years ahead of his time there. It's oh, and and his yeah, and his voicings are so well. Okay, so let's let's get into eighty one. Let's get into sure. this the sonata, and and it starts out and it has a, a short kind of introduction. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so this intro, when we talk about the Le Bevol, it's built in to the notes. So we have da, 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 and those are the um, it's the notes are G F and E flat. Uh, so going down to the tonic key, and it's le bevol, one syllable per note. And the notes themselves are, are very open. There's a third, there's a fifth, and there's a sixth. And that, to me, is very much like a horn uh, or mm-hmm. a, a duo, horn duo would play uh, in tune. And then it's, it's basically going to C minor I- immediately. So E flat, and then you're going to the relative minor. So it's like, oh, this is, oh, maybe not so. And know? did he actually write in le bevol above the staff? Yes. I mean, is, mm-hmm. is that what he did or did the publisher do that? No. So I have, I, I let me see if I have the manuscript. I have a reproduction of the manuscript, but it's a different measure. So I have an Urtext edition. Actually, I have many editions. This is this is one thing with pianists, uh, with Beethoven and Bach and maybe one, one or two other composers. Uh, we end up getting so many editions, and especially of the Beethoven sonatas. I think I have six editions of the Beethoven sonatas. Uh, because sometimes notes well, you learn different. something. Yeah, you do. sometimes notes are different uh, from one publisher to the next. Uh, editors have maybe added uh, different ornaments or different pedalings or different, uh, you know, something in there for the for the pianist to follow. And the other thing is fingerings can be very different. Hmm. And that that affects interpretation. So in this one that I have, I'm using. I often use Henley or the um, the uh, associated board version, the Toby, and that has Leibovol written over the uh, over the three notes, espressivo. So I think that was intended by by Beethoven. It's a very slow adagio introduction. Kind of reminds me of Pathétique, which has that adagio opening and then gets into the um, you know the Allegro primary section. And uh, because it's it's like that, the main theme, it's hard to say what the main theme is because the Allegro, Allegro starts almost like galloping right, uh, and then kind of song-like. But the opening is very melancholic and very, um, you know, some dotted rhythms and all these ornaments. And, yeah, it's very, very heartfelt. So. I don't know if that's really. I think that's a good way. I think that's a great word. It is very heartfelt, and and it's almost. Um, so it, um, recently, my my son just just moved out, mm. and um, and so to you know you go see him at his apartment, and you know you you're so excited for him, but at the same time, there's this melancholy, heartfelt sadness about it. That's like, you you know, it's, it's the end of a era in a way. Right. Yeah, and, exactly. And so I, I, I do definitely get that. That's a great way to, to say it's heartfelt going into the main theme. Yeah. And even here you see just how meticulous Beethoven was. We back to the early idea, earlier idea of his work ethic. You know, I remember when I was recording one of his violins uh, and piano sonatas that I think it was yeah, spring sonata uh, opus 24, I believe. And he, uh, one of his students or one of the critics at the time, Ferdinand Ries, has compiled a, a book of sketches and things by Beethoven. 
And in that particular piece, the melody, I think there were like seven or nine versions that he'd gone through. So he started with something, wasn't great. He tw- tweaked it a little bit, you know, wasn't great. Kept tweaking, kept moving. And by the end, you get this beautiful melody that's just amazing. And when you look at the first melody, you're like, oh my God, you know, a college graduate could, could write that. Um, but then you see how much he worked and how much he fine tuned and, and struggled with it to yeah. create the end result. And and his as a result, he was so meticulous in his in his writing and his composing, all the details, every little nuance that he wanted, he put into the score, um, which was not so common at the time. You know, Mozart, if you look at Mozart's scores, there's a, a bit in there, same with Haydn, but they're more sparse. Uh, and certainly with Bach. They're very sparse. They they wouldn't have even had articulation markings or even dynamic markings. You know that just wasn't there. And Beethoven was so intent on dynamics, proper dynamics, and and that's partially back to the idea of the piano development. Um, the forte piano was being developed, and and in his day, you know, you you had a much smaller range. I think about six octaves, and he kept writing pieces with with larger chords, lower notes. And, and as a result, the, he would call up Broadwood. This was the British piano maker and say, hey, you know, I, I need a piano that goes down to this note. I need a piano that, that can hold a double forte, a fortissimo chord. And okay, so here comes the Industrial Revolution. We start having these cast iron frames, you know, fairly soon after. I, I don't think Beethoven would have seen a cast iron frame, maybe the very beginning of it. But um, you know, he was pushing the boundaries. And also because the piano makers were competing with each other and making larger and uh, more extensive instruments, Beethoven could then write bigger and bigger pieces. Right. And then he used that to such great effect. Like Beethoven is very well known for this uh, subito piano, which is when you build up, you build up, you build up, and then immediately, immediately you're very soft. So it was. Uh, oh, and I think surprising. you know what I think that's a beautiful point when it comes to the the, the instrument itself and the development of the instrument because um, when we talk about a, a piano, you know, the original name was the forte piano, which you know means loud, soft. It was one of the few key instruments. I think maybe the only keyed instrument that you could have a, a a fairly large dynamic range. But even then, Beethoven's day or Mozart's day is it is so limited. Um, and and today we 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 take for granted the mm-hmm. the sometimes when we talk about you know the how how these how the piano um, has influenced music uh, we talk about in terms of these big chords and how broad and loud and and dynamic dynamic um, it can be but but the real to me like the real key to how beautiful an instrument is is how soft it can be played uh-huh. and yeah. how. And and that in that full range, if you can play if you can play a note and have it hold and carry in a concert hall, and have it be pianissimo, mm-hmm. I mean that's a remarkable thing for an instrument. Yeah, and it's it's voicing too. I mean, I often tell my students something that I was told from a teacher is that we're, we're there's a lot of smoke and mirrors to great pianism, and you're you're dealing with the psyche. You're basically fooling the audience's mind into thinking that they're hearing something when they might not be. So for example, dynamics, um, we don't, as humans, we don't hear objective th- uh, volumes. We, we don't hear an, oh, that's uh, so many hertz. We hear it in relative terms. So if you've played a large section, a lot of chords, a lot of thick chords, very loud, and then you drop to a, a small dynamic, I mean, it's it's like earth shattering, but in the, the, re- the reverse, reverse. And so it's such a surprise. Um, but you can fool people by playing slightly louder, what we call voicing in the piano. And a lot of instruments don't have to deal with this, but you play a much louder top note or the melody note and everything else in between or, or below it is, is softer. So that one note might be actually mezzo forte, mm-hmm. uh, but the rest of it is piano. And the, the brain registers that or the ear registers that as piano because right. we hear the whole texture. Uh, so it's very interesting how you can fool people if if you do it correctly and if you're really um, you're very controlling, skilled. <laughs> yeah, if you can control that, uh, yeah, it's very skilled. So Beethoven loves to do those kinds of things, have those effects on his listeners. Um, and so, yeah, that subito piano is like a, it's a Beethoven trademark. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Absolutely. So um, 
All right, so so we're going through this this main theme in the in the beginning of this sonata, the beginning of this the sonata form of the the first movement, um, and 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 as a as a performer, t- talk us through that a little bit. Like, what are sure. um, you know, what are some of the things that you're thinking about as you're performing this during the the opening section or, or you know yeah. the the first few pages? Well, the, I have to say, the first page we always think, oh boy, here's the easy page, and. <laughs> Hope, I hope that second page never comes because it's so hard. Right. But, uh, We're going to first... slow that intro down. Yeah. 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 Give me some time to prepare those, those chords. And for those of you that do have a score, I'm talking about saying this part at uh, measure, measure 15 of the Allegro section. So, um, yeah, it's just, it's beautiful. It's very reminiscent and um, introspective, I think, the opening. So when I play this, I'm listening to the effects of the sound, how it's washing over me, how it's washing over my audience if I'm in a hall and listening to the resonance, the feedback from the hall as best I can. Uh, it's very hard to pedal. You know, pedaling in this piece is extremely difficult. Connecting with your fingers and not necessarily blurring the pedal, um, making sure the rests are, are as long as they need to be because those are often gasps of air. Um, not in the way when we talk about pictures, the sort of... Uh, I guess really forceful, but but it's just like ah, you know, sighing or expectant. Um, right. And then we get into this allegro section, very not so tumultuous because it's it is triumphant. But uh, these kind of bells come out, this B flat down, bum bum bum, and the syncopation drives it forward. And then you have these double thirds, just very uh, impressive technical stuff, which was more characteristic of Beethoven's early years. If you look at his early sonatas. Um, or some of Haydn's sonatas or Mozart's sonatas, that kind of, or Clementi. Clementi loved double thirds mm-hmm. uh, and just this uh, knuckle busting stuff. But Beethoven uses it here with with great effect. And then he brings this this theme in. I guess you could say the second theme, da, 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 which uh, also comes. Um, da, 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 yeah. It kind of morphs a little bit into the uh, into the third movement. See that again. So the return in the third movement is actually a return of some of the same material, just converted a bit or, or fiddled around with. Right. So that that's kind of a good cyc- cyclical structure, and he ties things together that way. Um, you know, I won't I won't get into too, too much more. I think you'll start to hear when you listen to some of these themes. I assume you'll you'll play some of this or or snippets of it. Yes, I will. Uh, okay, and um, and then you know that that hard part returns, but there's a lot of anticipation and kind of waiting and suspense in this movement, where you'll have a, a chord like a diminished chord, if that means anything to anybody. It's just kind of this uh, dissonant it's, chord. It's the it's the scary chord. It's the score. It's the chord that doesn't. If it doesn't go anywhere, we all go what. Yeah, what's going on? It's in the movies when you see the the person opening the door to the dark house. It's ding, right. and then that's Wah. exactly. So he has a lot of those where you just are suspending and having this sparse texture. It's like what's going to come up next, and then he surprises you.
Um, and so, again, that ties in very well with the story, if you think about this programmatically. Um, we get into the second movement. Can, after, can I add one oh, other thing about sure. the first movement before um, we get into the second movement? At the end of the second, at the end of the first movement, um, he does some really beautiful things with his with the left hand in the in the bass clef. Um, and he has some really nice voicings um, down very, very low. And I think that's a very Beethoven thing. That's something that you don't really hear until Beethoven. Um, and and I, for some reason, I, I love it that he plays with, you know, things you wouldn't normally hear that low. The thirds, the the um, the um, the sixth, the you know, some of those some of those kind of even even a second, you know, mm-hmm. that that you would not hear and, and sounds so off putting normally, but he's able to pull it off. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, he takes that theme, that opening Lebeville theme, which is more in the middle register and, and goes into the upper, and he brings it down. It's almost like an echo, or if you're if you're a movie producer, you'd say, okay, we're going to have this shot, and then later in the movie, that shot is going to just be hazy, and and that's what I feel he's doing. He's he's almost being a movie director here. Yeah, um, I and I agree, beautiful. but but I think that's so. Like I I mean I heard. I don't think I, I heard it anything quite like that with Mozart or Haydn or, uh-huh. you know, where, where he's really using the, um, oh, uh, the, the, the clashing of, of, um, of, of the range? low right. bass yeah. notes. Yeah. Um, because they don't, that, that's true. The register, we don't hear the same way, uh, in the top register, higher registers, our ears can, uh, can parse things more, more easily. And it's clearer, uh, with right. the, Bass register. The the reason is that um, you have overtones that are sounding, and so when you have overtones um, that are audible, so when you have a very low note, you have o- overtones that are within our audible range, and we can hear them. When you have the very high notes, we don't hear the overtones on like the fifth or sixth overtone above that, um, un- unless you're the crazy conductor Salibidachi who always claims to hear twelfth overtones. <laughs> hogwash. But um, you know, our our human ears are only capable of hearing up to I don't know what it is twenty some odd hertz. Uh, yeah, hertz. twenty twenty thousand hertz. Yeah, and so, and as you get older, you kind of lose that. So the the fact that he uses these same intervals, like a third or a second in the bass, you're getting a lot more distortion and a lot more kind of interference and dissonance. Um, and it's cool how he plays with that. Right, and so when when you hear that echo, it is like an echo where it, it's a distorted echo. It's an yeah, echo, distorted echo, you know, right. far away. Yeah, exactly. Uh, that's a cool way to think about it. Yeah. Yeah, so then, then he comes into the second movement. Yeah, so this is the absence, and this is the, the really crying uh, movement where now his patron has left the city, he's, he's escaped with his life, and, uh, you know, the harmonies are, you, you don't, it's mysterious, you don't even know exactly where you're at. Uh, it's probably in C minor, uh, but it starts with a C and an E flat and an F sharp and an A. So you're like, this is a, what we'd call a common tone diminished seventh chord uh, with the C as a root. And it's kind of just leaves you hanging for a while uh, and you don't get to a real theme, a singable theme until later on. Uh, but yet very sad. A little bit of hope, but then another key. And that, that da-da-da is very, to me, rem- reminiscent of a folk yodel almost. Or in, in uh, Jewish custom, we would have the cantor often uh, you know, singing like that kind of right. melismatic stuff. And I'm sure in in, uh, in like Gregorian chant, you'd have a lot of melisma there. But that to me is a very folk element and a very crying, da-da-da-da-da, you know, really pleading. So yeah, th- there's a very, well, it's almost a, a longing. It's a, yeah. like, you know, um, and, and again, remind me the, 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 um, the name of this movement. So I, I have a hard time with this, but Abwesenheit and Wesenheit. or in the uh, absence in French and in English just absence. Absence. So yeah, it is definitely has a, a very longing, you know, feel to it. It's, mm-hmm. it's, which I, which I do, you know, um associate with Gregorian chants and and mm-hmm. those you know the the Jewish singing that you you talk about I think of it as a longing for God a longing for a, you're, you're absent you're you're yeah. awaiting something there's almost crying or wailing in in here so if you look at like uh talk about 
Beethoven being very specific about his nuance, nuances. So in measure, I'm looking at measure 11 here, we have these dotted rhythms, dotted 16th to 32nd note, with a yeah. sforzando and a slur. So it's da, 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 and it rises. I mean, that's as close to wailing as you're going to get in music. So Right. Yeah, it's very well, a very good translation of human emotion and action into uh, into music. And then it, and then it and it goes into this long kind of I it's not a run per se because it's not mm-hmm. fast at all but it's this, it's kind of this long single passage of just like a sigh afterwards yeah it's like you're meandering you're lost you're really lost there you're like, da, 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 yeah he doesn't know and then finally you arrive da, 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 kind of a, a nice melody we're finally in a major key as well. Um, although we're in D major, which is or or a G major rather, which uh, I guess would be five of C minor. So yeah, very 
very interesting. Well, and, and it's such a short movement. The movement's mm-hmm. very short. And, and that's the other thing that's interesting about um, Beethoven's sonatas is, is he'll play with, with that kind of thing. Like he'll have very short and the, the, or, or movements that run right into the, another one. And Yeah. And this one has a, this is a, an Ataka movement. So often we have uh, previous composers, you know, each movement is, is on its own. Each movement has a beginning and a closing. It's very obvious. Uh, and in the first movement here, it's obvious the ending. Dum, bum, bum, you know, just like anything would end. But the second movement doesn't really end. The second movement, if we're talking harmonically, stays on this 5-7 mm-hmm. uh, chord, and it's just suspended. You're like, wait, what's coming up next? And it right. connects right into the, the third movement with a, with a really a bang and a bash. Uh, so yeah, that's that, those are connected in a taka movement, and that's very interesting too to put two movements together. So it's almost like a two movement sonata, uh, and even the first movement has the adagio second section and then the allegro section, so it's slow fast, like an intro to the, the main component. And this is similar; it's like a slow melancholic, you know, um, uh, section, and then going into the main the main course being the third movement. So maybe you can look at this as a four part. Uh, sonata is slow, fast, slow, fast. I mean, there's so many ways to think about the structure of this. Right. And, and it gives you all those options. Oh, that's, and, and, and this is, and this is the return. This is the, the, you know, the triumphal, like what we've been longing for finally arrives. Yeah. And this is very difficult uh, and very pianistic, but very virtuosic. Dun, do, 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 do. Uh, and if you hear the opening of this, just just to get the two hands together and all this flashy stuff, um, very interesting and very tough. And then it, it's just a quick intro, and then leads to the main theme, da, 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 you know, um, which uh, which I love. And then it just embellishes that, uh, and it's a pretty straightforward, you know, piece in terms of the form. The, the third movement, the form, it, you can definitely hear the sections. Um, right. But I, I love it. And then we get this theme. So we have the little, dun, 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 the little titillations kind of joking around. And then this theme da, 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 kind of reminiscent of the first movement. Right. Oh. I mean, this is just full of pyrotechnics as far as mm-hmm. pianistic. Whoa. <laughs> yeah. This is this is the time you show off as a pianist. Yeah. Yeah. It's I, I tell you, when I recorded this um I recorded this in Banff, so in 2006 or seven around then, uh, and it, it, this was a quite a challenge. I'd probably do some things differently now, just you know, interpretively. But I, I remember the, the sheer amount of practicing to get some of these runs, which are almost when you when you see them, they're almost fast, too fast for our ears to hear. Right. Where they're like triplets. Oh, I was just going to mention that. I've, you know, you talk about how intricate he was about his playing. I mean, when he would play, when he would write these runs, a lot of these, you, you got these 16, these very, very fast 16th notes going up. And then all of a sudden you have, you have a triplet that, that your ear can't even hardly perceive the difference. Uh huh. Yeah. And you almost have to, you, you have to try to think of that or bring that out while you're playing. Um, like in measure 50, what is that? 57 or something. You know, you, you want to line things up with the left hand because the left hand is always very solid. Da, 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 da. Right. Um, that. So it's... Yeah. Yeah. So... Oh, I can't wait to play this for you guys to hear it because you're going to be blown away. It's a pretty, pretty neat piece.
away and that comes back and then i'm trying to think if there's any he sometimes doubles the uh the melody so you have something in octaves comes mm-hmm. back in another key and uh and i love these this section where it, it happens twice so one place is at uh 130 where you have these big bells and it's just like oh yes will stop so you have this huge run <laughs> And I, by the way, I, I have a very interesting fingering for the, the that E flat run. If anybody plays this sonata, um, there are multiple fingerings to use. So I'll, I'll just for the piano files out there, uh, I'm I'm talking mostly of. Let's see where does it start. Uh, measure twenty nine. So the fingering in my score and what most people use, I believe, is one four two five one three. Okay. One four two five one three. One four two five one three. Um. And I know Jessica, actually, my fiance, she, you know her, she's also a concert pianist and, and yes. ordered this herself and uses, she has much smaller hands too, which that, that changes how you do fingerings. But I think she uses one, four, two, five, three, five, one, four, two, five, three, five. Um, and I use one, three, one, four, two, five, which actually breaks some rules. So we're taught as, as pianists, you know, don't put um, thumbs on black keys. Especially with arpeggios, you know, you want to use the thumb for the white keys and the longer fingers for the black keys. Uh, but in this case, the the second inversion chord for E flat just fits very well for me, and, um, and it's easier for me to get to that that kind of trill in thirty one, the A B flat. So right. Um, so that's that's my fingering. You can try it. It's pretty unorthodox i don't know other people anybody else that uses that so you said you said you use one two one four uh one three one four two five one three one four oh yeah i see that yeah so this, that's kind of oh, for the piano files that are listening to you you know that, that might play this piece, but, um that might not mean anything to anybody else but then we get this what i call the bell section so after um and i don't mean the specific uh, group <laughs> the bells <laughs> uh, anyway, so at measure 37, we have this huge run, and then bum, 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 and these are separated, and one long pedal. Beethoven does not write pedal for all those. It's the same harmony, even though he writes rests. So it's like, well, and staccatos. So it's yeah, like he gives staccatos and rests, and <laughs> yeah, it's it's sort of paradoxical, and and I love this about great composers because it makes you think. What were what were they thinking? What do they mean? So you've got this long pedal that's obviously going to go over the rest. So why even write a rest? Why did not just write a dotted quarter note? But I think the um, and why write a staccato, which basically means short? And I think that he wanted the type of, of striking the note to be similar to that of a bell. So when you hit a bell, you know you you really thunk it, a uh, big bell, let's say, uh, in a clock tower, uh, so that they will. It will peel over the countryside. You don't, you know, kind of push the bell a little bit or, or hit it and try to keep the mallet stuck to the bell. You know, you really give it a big thwack, uh, whatever, thwack. And I think that's the approach technically that he wants. And so that's, at least that's my interpretation. That's why he wrote all of these. Uh, and he took time for all the minutiae. Well, I think when you hit a bell also, it's interesting. When you, when you hit a bell, we think of... Um, you know, a bell sound as kind of, you have this fundamental note, but really when you hit it, 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 it kind of, it goes, wow, you know, it, yeah. it has this quick bang and, and to do that on a piano. You actually do have to, just as he says, hit his Fort Sando staccato accented. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's in Fortissimo and as Fort Sando and, and the staccato with the pedal down. So you get as many overtones and right. that, uh, the attack from the string kind of making a twang as as you can without it being harsh you know um but i love that effect and that that place in the piece it seems like it seems like it doesn't belong it's like where how did this even get in there um it's maybe some repose or just like okay every, it's like you're in a in a wma or wwf fight like okay, right. time out time out now we're going to be doing the sing-along you know <laughs> and then uh okay well, this whole this whole movement feels very rapturous. It's it's almost you know it he it's it's like um, it's like he's so excited for this big return that it, it, you almost can't 
um, uh, it almost has to come all out at once. You, 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 mm-hmm. you can't be too methodical about it. Otherwise it doesn't really make sense emotionally. Yeah. It has to be a little nuts. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I think, to he, say it. <laughs> yeah, I think he really captures that spirit and, and then he goes this kind of, I guess, schizophrenic nature. He goes between so many different themes that are quite contrasting very quickly because the next theme is done very quiet after these big bells and then da, 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 like the languishing uh, over the countryside, very beautiful. And then here come the, the speed demons again. Um, it, it's really well put together. You don't really notice while you're listening. I mean, now I'm describing it all. And while you listen, you'll, you'll probably hear these things. But when you listen to it, you don't realize how much craft has gone into um, delineating these sections and making them fit together well, but also making them separate enough. Right. So, yeah, anyway, I I love this. And then similar thing for the second half. Um, And then I love the very ending. So I know we're, we've gone on quite a while, but I just want to talk. Okay, no, we're we're good. Okay, I want to talk a little bit because usually in sonata form, you have, the, the sonata form usually is a way to talk about the form of the first movement of a sonata. So it's a little strange. Um, usually the third movement of a sonata is in you know, rondo form or something like that. Second movements are, are maybe binary or more free form, ter- ternary maybe. But um, this last movement is almost like a sonata form with a coda added. And that coda, it seems like you should end at measure, what is like that? Like 175. 75. Yeah, that seems like a great ending. Lum, bum, bum. Okay, at the end of the but I still have one memory to talk about. You know, this is like the grandfather telling his kids about that same story. Right. And, and I love it. It's it's like out of nowhere. And it's just this really cool addendum, um, almost cheesy, but he doesn't hold it too long. And then he he just rips right back into it. Tempo one, one measure 181. Uh, it's like, yeah, you know what? That was a nice story. Here's the flat thing ending. Well, it, it, I, I love that what you just said. It's the grandfather retelling the story because, I mean, I, I know my grandfather served in, in World War II and he would tell these stories. And, you know, by the end of the story, he was up and he was, you know, into it. And he was, he, it was like he was there, you know what uh-huh. I mean? Right. It was, and, so, and so I think um, it, to me, this makes a whole lot of sense of, of you know, you, you, you've triumphantly the story has happened and now we're talking now we're it's like it's, it's a meta um meta story we're yeah. we're talking about the storyteller telling the story of the story <laughs> yeah it, it's really the the levels here that he brings into this piece if you want to read into it that way and i think there's no reason not to it's it's fascinating it's well, like he, he, he tells us person. in my opinion so i uh-huh. i mean i'm no musicologist but in my opinion he tells us to th- read almost read it this way just by giving the the title of i mean i don't know of another um sonata where the third movement is called the return yeah yeah, this you know. is uh, exactly. It's it's really well it's well thought out and planned, and I think, like you say, that is what he wants. That's what he's going for. And the fact that we can uh, we can still find those interpretive ideas and uh, and debate them and talk about them, you know, two hundred well, not fifty years after the piece this this was composed, but two hundred and ten years, you know, after this probably was composed. Uh, that's that's pretty amazing. It's remarkable, and it, it it talks to, it does it, it speaks to Beethoven as um, a great artist, being able to reach down into the human soul and and express something that that resonates even to this day. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and maybe maybe let's end on that. Let's let's talk yeah. let's talk a little bit about like Beethoven and his legacy, um, and maybe with this piece or or, or just f- what what thoughts do you have on on Beethoven? Um, and why he does resonate. Well, uh, I would say there are two things to look at uh, with that. And one would certainly be the next generation of composers and then every generation thereafter. But he had he was such a tower, towering figure that uh, even the likes of Brahms, who we now think of as, okay, he's one of the three Bs, you know, Bach, Beethoven, Brahms, great right. German composer. And he felt that he was always in the shadow of Beethoven and, and had a heck of a time writing his first symphony because he always thought, well, I've heard Beethoven's great symphonies. You know, I, I'm trying to think where Brahms was born. 18, yeah, so he would have already heard 
um, by the time he was uh, you know, right composing, he would have heard all of Beethoven's symphonies, and they are just so amazing that uh, you know what, what would he, he would have questioned, "What am I here for?" You know, everything's already been done, and of course, he was great, and he added to it. But I think Beethoven had a huge effect. Um, positive and negative uh, on the next generation of people to see like, oh, I, I could never reach those heights. I could never do, do what he did, you know, struggle as much as he did, work as hard as, as he did. Um, but it also gave them hope. It's like once somebody breaks that barrier, like when Bannister broke the four minute mile, it's like, well, you know, everybody can do it now. It's, it's possible. We've seen it. Right. And so I think Beethoven broke a lot of barriers, musical barriers, at least as to what was accepted a big thing and what was possible and so critics at the time if you if you read by the way i, I recommend for everybody this uh slonimsky's le- uh, i think it's called the lexicon of musical invective and it has wonderful stories from all eras of uh, western classical music and what the critics said of the composers at the time of course we we don't even remember the most of the critics but the composers have lasted and you know they pan beethoven for a lot of his his works are often visionary stuff saying, oh, it was too loud and then too soft and all over and banging and too much, too many notes and too fat, all the things that we love today. Um, right. Because it was just so, so new at the time. And so I think composers after him saw that, well, he, he did it, you know, so can I. Uh, so it's very empowering in, in that way. Uh, and I think he's still empowering people. We, we study this stuff uh, so that we can, we can develop our, our own voices. And the other way I would say, so that's, that's one of the ways I think he's really affected the next generation of composers and, and everybody subsequent, especially writing in these genres. Anybody writing a piano sonata has to look at Beethoven's, you know, 32 piano sonatas as the main, uh, every, everything's compared to that. Um, and we, we often joke in musical circles that uh, the Bach, the collection of preludes and fugues, you know, the two books of the well-tempered clavier, Right. 48 preludes and fugues are sort of the Old Testament and the uh, Beethoven 32 piano sonatas are the New Testament. I mean, that's, that's very good. There are many other things that you could one could look at, but those are such monumental sets in Western classical piano music that uh, you know, we, just, we, we can't we have to contend with them and think about them. So Beethoven really is a, a pillar in that regard and, and always a reference point. Um, he also was quite a, a well, he had a legacy of students. So, of course, Nowadays, everybody loves to just trace their lineage back to whomever, you know, back to Liszt, goes back to Beethoven. And, and I love watching, looking at these lineages. Sometimes it's like, really? I mean, I guess, you know, each generation is changing so much. And nowadays, teachers have so many students. Who's to say that, uh, you know, oh, you study with so-and-so, so you play like so No, of course not. Right. Uh, so it's kind of, kind of a stretch that uh, to, to trace yourself back to that because we can, we can all do that. Um, just to, to how many degrees, I don't know. But that the point is that he had some great students, uh, one of which was Carl Czerny. And I mean, uh-huh. if you talk about one of the greatest writers of exercises and, and even decent pieces, I mean, I wouldn't consider him a first-rate composer for all his, his works, although he has some first-rate works. Um, just his pedagogical, like he's, he's the father of, of piano pedagogy. Uh, and he's the oh, for sure. Artist. So... So we think of Beethoven's legacy just in the educational tradition uh, was huge uh, through his through mostly his student journey and and through criticism. I mean, uh, at this time you have Ries and, and others that are that are going to concerts and seeing people play their own works. You know, he was a, a lion at the keyboard. He was like the best keyboardist of his day, playing these huge works that nobody else could play at the time, expanding everything. And and so students. That he that would hear him would say, "Well, gosh, I, I should be able. I need to be able to do that. It's possible now." So again, a, a big boon and a big boost for uh, for just advancing pianism and piano pedagogy. Well, and I, I also now tell, correct me if I'm wrong. Was he the first, um, a, you know, semi modern, um, self made musician man? In other words, um, as a composer, of course, he had his he. he he had his patrons, um, but but he was he was one of the first people that that really like published his own work and and um, you know made, what, kind of a savvy businessman wasn't he? Yeah, I don't you know that's a good point. I I don't know too much about that uh, aspect of his life, and 
I know he worked with uh, some publishers. He was very savvy in choosing how to publish his works. I know he would get proofs from the, and, and correct them and make sure that the final edits were all because he was so meticulous. And so he had a huge control over the publishing process, much more than previous composers. Um, and a lot of previous composers just didn't have the rights to all that, or, or they'd send it to different countries and then they'd kind of lose track. But Beethoven, I think, tried to keep all of that in his in his domain and right. his control. And and it, it made made a difference, I'm sure, to future composers as well. Well, let me add one other thing that, that maybe you could speak to that I, that I feel as a, as a musician, you know, my you know, my, my personal, um, I guess, um, how he affects me when I listen to him. And I think it goes back to understanding what we talked about at the very beginning, understanding his life. He did have a very difficult life. Um, and he worked extremely hard and, it, and, you know, especially his later years as he, as his hearing got worse and worse and he grew, you know, probably further and further in depression from what we understand. Um, he, um, I, 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 and you see this in this piece we've been discussing. Um, I mentioned it often in the, in the, in the ninth symphony, but in a lot of pieces um, in his later works, he, his breadth of emotional, um, both lows and highs, I think are, are um, unsurpassed. And, and, you know, I, I, I mean, I, I, I can't think of a, of a composer who, who, who was able to draw into the, the, human emotion of, um, you know, pulling out everything. We talked about longing. We talked about joy. We talked about all of these emotions that are so, um, deep. He seemed to feel them and, and be able to express them deeper than, than most. Oh yeah, I, I agree. I think he, he really ran, uh, his expressions run the gamut of, of everything, the different types and the ups and downs, the highs and lows, um, the depth of his music. This is one reason why when pianists bring back a Beethoven, so oftentimes I've had to perform pieces that I haven't done for a long time, and I, I bring them back and restudy them, and I find new things in them. And it's always the case with Beethoven that when I restudy a work or when I even start teaching a work, I, I see more things. There's always something new to see. There's always some new angle. Uh, and you get, I think you get that with the great composers. I think part of that is creating that and, and the pianist has to be searching for that. But Beethoven gives you the fodder and he gives you the, you know, all the materials to work with. Um, and, you know, it is, it's hard to compare to somebody who's much later with a very different language and more, more options available to them. So even, even someone like Liszt that had a bigger piano, a bigger range, more sound, uh, you know, available to him, you, know, you could argue that he, he does even more. But does he get deeper? Does he get, um, I, maybe, I don't think so. Um, I think Beethoven's one of the deepest uh, composers and most meaningful composers. And, and every note has something. You know, Bach, I think, is is up there as well. Every note yes. is something and has a purpose. Uh, even someone like, like Chopin, I would put up there. Uh, Liszt, sometimes, not all the time. You know, a lot of the, the notes that he writes don't have the same purpose or it's like you could add a note and you could take out a note and it wouldn't be that different. Yeah. Uh, that's, Beethoven, that's... I feel, and, and that's a big argument too, is how, when we get our text editions, like how, um, how married to the, to the text do you have to be and and where is the interpretation of that off where it's like, no, you're not actually playing what Beethoven wrote, but I think Beethoven gives you so much to deal with um, that so many interpretations can be, can be worthy. Uh, and you can find, you can find reason for that. So yeah, I, I think there's such depth in his music. Uh, there's always so much meaning in it, and and I think that's why he's lasted so long. And, and also because you know he he became big, and and people have continued to promote him and and push him. But I think there's some some reason for it. Uh, you know, if you look at even other composers from that era that were maybe famous in that era, equally as famous. Uh, Trying to think if Kalkbrenner was a little bit after, or Hummel, you know, the, around that time, even even Haydn, Mozart, they were a little bit before. Schubert certainly overlapped for a little bit, um, you know. But even even in that lifetime, Schubert was not nearly recognized as Beethoven was. Later, we, we came to see how great he was. But um, yeah, Beethoven still, I think, 
has more to say or, or more variety or more depth to say than a lot of the other composers. Um, yeah. Well, and he, and he did, he lived at such a unique period of time that um, where he was able to um, push the limits of so much. And, and, you know, we, I, we can go on about this for, for hours. So um, I'm going to actually, we're going to, we're going to go ahead and, and take a pause <laughs> because we're going to, we're actually, I'm very excited because we're going to do another podcast soon, hopefully. Um, and we're going to talk about another great composer um, a little bit later on and another worthy uh, uh, addition to, you know, the, to Western culture, we're going to be talking about Chopin um, because this also, this is his 210th anniversary mm-hmm. of his birth. Is that correct? Born in 1810, I think March something. Yeah. Oh, uh, fantastic. So that's going to be another treat for everybody. So we're going to do that soon. And we'll I am talk again, about um, sonata, I think. I'm sorry, t- say that again. We'll, we'll talk about a sonata. Yes, we will, t- which will be fascinating because we get to compare sonatas a yeah, little bit. And that, that'll, be, that'll cool. be fun. So, again, uh, this is Mike Levitt I, with And If Love Remains. I've been speaking with Dr. Elias Axel Pedersen um, about Beethoven, the Les Adieu, P- uh Piano Sonata Number 26. And uh, I thank you so much for being on the show. I, it's always so much fun. It, 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 it's a highlight when we get to have you on. Thanks. Yeah, I, I love talking through this. So thanks again, and I look forward to our next uh, discussion. Fantastic. All right, this is And If Love Remains. You can find us at www.andifloveremains.com. Um, we have merch there, so if you want to support the show, but the best thing you can do to support the show is to share it with your friends, share it with uh, your, your music lovers out there, um, and 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 most of all, listen to some Beethoven this year. Listen to it and, and learn to love what he's, what he's put out there. Um, uh, Elias, his website is www.eapetterson.com so you can find out more about him there. And uh, let's talk some Chopin next time. Sounds great. Thanks so much, Mike. You bet. Thanks.